Hello, fellow Shakespeareans. Welcome to 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, episode 10 of Song Spear 2020. This one is Measure for Measure. Mm -hmm. Measure for Measure is another one song wonder. It only has one song text in the whole play, and I chose to do multiple settings of the same one because there are a few. That song is Take, Oh, Take Those Lips Away. It opens Act 4, Scene 1, and it is kind of the first introduction we get to the character Mariana. Um, so a, a boy is supposed to sing it, so she doesn't actually sing it herself. But the way that the song is sung, the way that the song is presented, has a lot to do with how the audience first meets that character. The song is not a very veiled reference to her own experience. She was betrothed, she was supposed to marry Angelo, he decided not to marry her when her dowry fell through, and life got worse for her. And so the song talks a lot about that sort of betrayal, and love being a fickle thing, and kisses that don't mean what you think they mean. There's a fairly well-known setting by Roger Quilter. I chose not to sing it because it's fairly well-known, but it is one of his more beautiful settings. I actually really like that one. So if you can, go look up somebody singing Roger Quilter's setting of Take, Oh, Take Those Lips Away. Those? These? Those. Since this episode will be another meditation on a single text, I decided it might be nice to just read the text. It's a very short song text as they go. So, Mariana and a singing boy enter, and the boy sings... Take, oh, take those lips away that so sweetly were forsworn, and those eyes, the break of day, lights that do mislead the morn. But my kisses bring again, bring again, seals of love, but sealed in vain, sealed in vain. The eyes are, seem like the break of day, but they mislead the morn. The kisses bring again, but they're sealed in vain. Not working out very well for whoever is in this song. Something that I noticed about all of the settings, but especially the ones that I chose, was that they focus on different elements of the text. Just really sad, really forlorn, you know, oh, boo-hoo, the love didn't work out. Or you could take it as being a little bit more ironic, bitter, having a little bit more of an edge to it. Uh, you could fall somewhere in the middle, and I think that that goes back to how we perceive Mariana because of this song. Is she kind of a sad sack about what happened to her? Is she bitter about it? Has she moved on? Does she even care anymore? Uh, I think you have a really big opportunity with this song. Now, would you use any of these songs in the play? You probably could. I think they're all appropriate. More than that, I think I think I wanted to investigate those layers of, of different emotional impacts. So I decided to organize the songs, in my opinion, from sort of the most sentimental, the most ooey-gooey, touchy-feely, to the most overtly dramatic. Some people might think those are the same thing, but I think of sentimental as being just a, emotional, but sort of detached, like, oh, isn't this all sad? Whereas dramatic is more in it, you know, I'm feeling this, I'm angry, those eyes, they were forsworn, that sort of thing. And then in the middle, we'll get a little bit of, of neither, or a little bit of both. The first setting is by John Parsons Beach, a composer who was completely unknown to me before this episode. He lived from 1877 to 1953, so he was sort of a transitional into the 20th century composer. He was an American composer. He taught at several different colleges. Eventually, he wound up settling down in Pasadena. And he also was taught and, and had a lot of works premiered in Europe. He has no relation to Amy Beach, who is at the end of this, so we're kind of surrounded by beaches, hanging out in between two beaches. Sailing with this, I'll stop now. This setting has the most sentimental sort of drawing room feel. It's a, it's a very gentle vocal line, it's a very gentle accompaniment. There's nothing that's gonna sort of reach out and grab you necessarily. Um, but I do think that given that, the end is a little bit of a surprise. There's a point at the end where it just sort of stops and then it doesn't end with quite exactly what you would have expected or there's no transition into that ending. I'm going to assume that was a compositional choice and not just sort of wah wah at the end running out of ideas. Then It seems like a choice. So this is John Parsons Beach and his setting of Take Oh Take Those Lips Away. i 
The second setting is by Mario Castelnuovo Tedesco, the extremely long last named composer from Italy that we have heard from before. Just as a reminder, he lived from 1895 to 1968, so more thoroughly in the 20th century, and his music definitely sounds like that. His accompaniments are always very interesting, there's a lot of depth, many of them I can't play very well. And this piece is actually fairly sentimental. Some of his, uh, well, all of his music, I think, tends to have a little bit of a touch of irony, a little bit of that 20th century pessimism to it. Um, but this one, especially because it has this little triplet figure, this little do-do-do-do, do-do-do-do, do, 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 and all the harmony sort of wraps around that. Um, it makes it very maybe nostalgic. There's just this, you know, there is something to cling to. But as the harmony changes, there are these sort of sour chords, there's dissonance. Um, so it's a little bit less sentimental. The vocal line is fairly fluid and doesn't have a lot of the sort of declamatory dramatic things that you might find in some of his other settings. Um, but again, there are some angular things toward the end that, that let you know not all is right in this in this situation. So this is Mario Castelnuovo Tedesco's setting of Take O Take Those Lips Away. Take O Take Those Lips Away That's so sweet And those eyes, the break of day, lights that do mislead the moon. But my kisses bring again, bring again. See third setting is sort of out of the realm of sentimentality completely. It's Edmund Rubra, who lived from 1901 to 1986. Very much a 20th century composer and kind of a surprisingly 20th century voice for British composition especially. There's nothing against British composers, but at the beginning of the 20th century they were doing largely sort of just late romantic things with harmony. Um, Edmund Ruber tends to be still in that tradition, but he pushes the boundaries of it. So the harmony in this setting, uh, the chords don't all fit together, they don't all go in an order that you would expect. It's not atonal by any means. But uh, he learned from Gustav Holst. He learned, he actually had Ray von Williams as a substitute teacher when Gustav Holst was out. You know. This setting I put between the sentimental pieces and the dramatic pieces because it's just kind of weird. Uh, it's definitely not, um, it's not austere necessarily. There are moments of emotion, but I think it's the sense that the harmonies are so unrelated to each other that we sort of, we delve into an emotional place and then before you would have expected to leave it, we go on to something else that's in a different harmonic landscape and, you know, we kind of move around in that sense. So I think Rubra's interpretation of the text is sort of that you're, you know, the love goes here and it goes here and all of these promises are being made, but it's almost such a whirlwind that there's nothing to hold on to. At least those are the words that came out of my mouth right now. So this is Edmund Rubra, who if you don't know Vrubra's works, you should look up more of them because I love them. There are like great chamber works for voice. There's a, there's string quartets with tenor and string quartet. They're great. Anyway, Edmund Rubra's setting of Take O oh, Take Those Lips Away. Take O oh, Take 
take those lips away that so sweetly were forsworn, and those eyes the break of daylight that do mislead the moon, but my kisses bring again. Sealed in vain, sealed in vain. The fourth setting is by another composer we've heard from before, another British composer, Hubert Perry. He lived from 1848 to 1918, I think. Got it. I've used a lot of settings by Perry in this project so far. I really like them, and really if you're thinking about mid-1800s is when he was born, he only lives until 1918. He really is a late romantic, kind of pre-20th century voice, but his his use of, of the art song is is more sort of forward looking, I think. The harmonies are surprising in this one, you know, key changes sort of come out of nowhere. Um, he just has a really interesting voice that I, I feel was ahead of his time for what a lot of his other fellow composers were doing in England. This setting goes into the dramatic portion of our of our settings of this text, more of an emotional involvement from the singer. That's sort of my my litmus test. However, at the end, we get a little bit more of a sort of ironic turn, surprising harmonies that aren't fully just dramatic. There's a little bit of a self-conscious wink toward the end with a really, really unsettled vocal line. So what I would say is fully dramatic vocal writing would, would end in a very, really strong cadence, probably a big money note on the tonic, or at least on the tonic chord, something like that. This particular piece just sort of trails off on a really surprising note. Um, I won't say which one if you're partial to some of them, but we really, the vocal line doesn't, doesn't really ever have any closure, and then even the piano's closure is marred by that, that same note uh, that was so unsettling. So dramatic, but still with a sense of, uh, of angularity. This is Hubert Perry's setting of Take O oh, Take Those Lips Away. Take those lips away that so sweetly were forsworn, and those eyes, the break of day. The final setting, which I'm naming the most dramatic setting of all of them, is by Amy Beach, who lived from 1867 to 1944. 
We've heard from Amy Beach before, I think once in a Midsummer Night's Dream. Um, she's a well-known composer, well, well-loved uh, woman composer, um, one of the most noteworthy ones. She was a pianist who was actually fairly famous um, in her youth, and then uh, she decided not to pursue her music career as much um, when she was married to her husband, just so that she could be committed to being a wife and a homemaker. No comment, but after he died, she decided to go around and went to Europe and started composing all these wonderful works, and I think we were well served by that. This setting is the most dramatic, in my opinion, because it's just a really, really fluid use of the voice. Um, it's, you know, kind of thoroughly grounded uh, in its minor key. I mean, there's, there's interesting harmony because of Amy Beach being a 20th century composer, somewhat, but... The, the singer is putting all of the emotion behind it, the lines are sort of dramatic, and high notes are where you'd expect high notes to be, the, the whole thing sort of um, ends in a, in a tidy place, so just floating, um, you know, floating on a, a one chord, basically, floating on the tonic. Um, so that's what I, that's what I decided. This would be, this would be the version of Mariana that probably is how she felt immediately after everything happened. She was, she was feeling it, and angry, and sad, and just messed up. So, this is Amy Beach's setting of Take O oh, Take Those Lips Away. Take O oh, Take Those Lips Away That's so sweetly And there you have it. Those are five different settings of Take O oh, Take Those Lips Away from Measure for Measure. Let me know what you thought about the different pieces. Let me know if you liked it. Let me know if you hated them. Let me know if you're like sentimental, dramatic. What does any of that even mean? I don't really know. Feel free to like, comment, subscribe, do all the things down below. I didn't really mention it, but I will also post links to uh, anything else that I find interesting about this. As always, thank you for watching and happy Shakespearing. about the different pieces, pardon you.